Formula One's history in the United States has been filled with controversy. In the 1950s, the Indy 500 counted as an F1 Grand Prix and accounted for seven deaths in seven years, making Indianapolis technically the most deadly track in F1's history. Of course, we all know the story of the 2005 U.S. Grand Prix at Indianapolis, and even now there is a huge uproar in the F1 community about the amount of races in the United States and the potential for even more GPs to be added in the coming years. However, these aren't the controversies we're going to talk about today. We're going to take a look at F1's grim history at another U.S. circuit, Watkins Glen International. Construction for WGI, located in upstate New York, began in 1956. By 1958, the track's president was already hunting for an F1 race date. This was pretty ambitious because there were only 11 races on the 1958 calendar, with an existing United States date because of the Indy 500. In 1959, the United States Grand Prix was held in Sebring, while the 1960 edition was held at Riverside International. Finally, in 1961, the Glen got its shot to host a Formula One race after a deal with Daytona fell through before the season. The first race at the Glen was destined to fail. It was the last race of the season, and Phil Hill had already clinched the world championship. Tragically, Hill's teammate was killed in a horrible crash at Monza that also killed multiple spectators. Ferrari opted not to make the trip to the U.S. after this incident. Ultimately, many thought the event would fail due to the lack of Ferrari's presence, but this event was an overwhelming success. It was the first American GP to turn a profit and was crowded with 60,000 race fans. The race was also the first race win for Lotus, which marked the beginning of an era for that iconic team. Walkton's Glen defied all odds and was an overwhelming success. However, this wasn't the last time WGI faced adversity. In 1969, Graham Hill was already enduring a tough season when the field rolled up to Walkton's Glen. He had only two podiums heading into the race, the second to last race of the 1969 season, after winning the 1968 championship. He struggled with handling throughout the race and spun out on lap 90. Hill got out of his car to check the damage and noticed the rear tires were completely bald. When he got back to his car, he wasn't able to properly buckle himself in because he needed help of his mechanics to do so. Hill still got into his car and headed to the pit lane. Just seconds after he signaled that he would be coming in for fresh rubber, one of his rear tires blew and Graham was launched out of his car. Two 15-year-old boys saw the crash and stated, It looked like the crash was unsurvivable. We thought he had definitely been killed. The two-time world champion survived, but suffered serious leg injuries and was advised to never race again. Naturally, Graham Hill would miss only one race and would take part in the 1970 season opener. Entering the final race of 1973, Team Terrell was celebrating another championship season after Jackie Stewart claimed his third driver's title and had the chance to win the Constructors' Championship pending a good final race. Jackie's teammate of four years and great friend, Francois Servere, won the 1971 USGP at Walkton's Glen and was determined to repeat. However, tragedy struck at the Glen once again in Saturday's qualifying session. With just 15 minutes left, Servere crashed violently in the uphill S's between turns 3 and 4. He ran too high on the curbs going up the hill and smashed into the right side of the guardrail. He hit the wall at approximately 150 miles per hour at a near 90 degree angle. The front nose of the car dug into the guardrail, causing the car to flip over the wall and ripping the car in half. Jody Schechter stopped on the track and rushed for help, but it was too late. Francois died instantly. Jackie Stewart was distraught at the loss of his teammate and friend. It was a horrendous accident which took the life of a wonderfully charming, personable, handsome young man who was a tremendous friend to both Helen and me. I had decided in April that I would retire at the end of the season, win or lose. Walkton's Glen was going to be my last race in a Formula 1 car. Servere was going to be number one in the team from 1974 although he never knew it. Ken Terrell and I had kept it a secret that I was going to retire after that race. In fact, not even my wife Helen, who was with me that weekend, knew. Jackie and the entire Terrell team withdrew from the race, ultimately handing the championship to Lotus. 
The very next season, on lap 10 of the U.S. Grand Prix, history would repeat itself. Helmuth Koenig was only in his second ever Grand Prix when his car suffered a suspension failure entering the Turn 7 hairpin. Koenig was going at a relatively slow speed, but hit head on into the wall, much like Cerver in the year prior. However, the Armco barrier wasn't installed properly. The bottom portion of the barrier crumbled as the car impacted it, while the top portion stayed intact. As Koenig passed through, he was decapitated and killed instantly. Two weeks before the race, the 1967 world champion, Denny Holm, warned track officials to move back the guardrails in some spots of the track, however no changes were made. In March of that same year, Peter Revson was killed in a test in preparation for the South African Grand Prix after hitting a guardrail head-on. We've seen a pretty recent example of a guardrail failing with Roman Grosjean's 2020 crash at Bahrain. A guardrail failing may be the scariest scenario in Formula 1, but it seems that the halo may have helped completely solve that issue. That, along with improved barrier technology. Current Tech Pro barriers give and allow for a lot of energy to be taken out through the barriers themselves, rather than the cockpit the driver is seated in. Guardrails are meant to give, but as we've seen with these two incidents, they fail easily and are far from reliable. Also, the addition of long asphalt runoffs or gravel traps for new tracks helps slow cars before they get into the barrier or prevent them from making any contact whatsoever. The Glen relies almost solely on guardrails with minimal runoff sections and gravel traps, so it makes sense as to why there were a couple tragic incidents at the track and why Formula 1 doesn't race there anymore. Anyways, as far as Watkins Glen goes, the circuit owners made desperate attempts at making various safety changes, including a chicane being added in 1975 before the S's, but after the 1980 season, the Glen was dropped from the calendar after being deemed too unsafe for competition. That and the track owed $800,000 to the teams and never paid the debt. However, Watkins Glen did provide one of the most important safety innovations in F1's history. After Ronnie Peterson's death, after a huge crash on the opening lap of the 1978 Italian Grand Prix, the Formula One Constructors Association chief Bernie Ecclestone and Professor Sid Watkins concluded a medical car should follow the pack on the opening lap of the race. The first use of this concept was at the 1978 US Grand Prix and has stuck ever since. This innovation has come into play many times since its introduction, Gerhard Berger, who had a crash at Imola in 1989, may owe his life to this idea. There are numerous occasions where the medical car arrived on the scene quicker than other officials could have arrived, which is pretty much the case on any lap one incident. Anyways guys, that is the history of Formula 1 at Watkins Glen. I hope you did enjoy, and if you did, make sure to leave a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.